Welcome to the International Civil Rights Center and Museum's 2023 Kwanzaa Lecture Series. Habarigani, what is the word? That is the greeting for Kwanzaa. And the response would be today's word is Kuji Jakalia. On the second day of Kwanzaa, our presenter, Dr. Gwendolyn McLaughlin Bookman, is a native North Carolinian. She completed her secondary education in the segregated public school system in Durham, North Carolina. She graduated with her bachelor's degree from Howard University and her law degree from Thurgood Marshall School of Law at Texas Southern University. In addition, she completed postgraduate work in law, diplomacy, and social change at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Dr. Bookman has served in a variety of positions in academia, and as a lawyer, she was the first black woman to serve as a briefing attorney for the Supreme Court of Texas. Dr. Gwendolyn McLaughlin Bookman will speak about the self-determination of the women of the 60s and the significant but seldom told role of the women of Bennett College in the sit-in movement. On the second day of Kwanzaa, the International Civil Rights Center and Museum is proud to present Dr. Gwendolyn Bookman speaking on the principle of Kuji Jakalia, self-determination. To define and name ourselves as well as create and speak for ourselves. Welcome to day two of Kwanzaa. Kuchi Chakalia, self-determination. And I am Gwen Bookman, and I'm so pleased to be here with you. At Kwanzaa, we celebrate our African roots. We affirm our African heritage and culture. Through the practice, of Kwanzaa principles, we are empowered. We reflect on the truth of who we are as a people. Remember, our history did not begin with slavery here in America. This is so aptly expressed and embodied in the second principle of Kwanzaa. Kuchi Chakalia. When you really decide and think about self-determination, there are several aspects of it that I think are important for us to embody. We are able to define ourselves, we are able to create for ourselves, and we are able to speak for ourselves, both individually and collectively. This principle of Kwanzaa speaks to our ability to make our own choices, to control our own destinies, and to act in our own best interests. It reminds us that we must decide our own path and we must make our own decisions that impact our lives. There are three examples that are personal to me that I would like to share with you in terms of how I see this principle manifested. As you have been told in my introduction, I am a faculty member at Bennett College. Bennett an HBCU, a historically black college, was founded in 1873. Can you imagine what it was like at that time for newly emancipated people determining for the first time for themselves what was important to them? And it was not uncommon for them to decide that education was going to be at the top of their agenda. And so you find in many southern states, HBCUs, historically black colleges, 
founded by newly emancipated people. And it is no wonder that they did that. Black people were not permitted to learn to read and write during slavery. And that was an important impediment to them because one of the most important aspects of determining your own path, your own destiny, what is going to be good for you and your family, is for you to be able to read and to write. What I want to point you to is something that I pass very often on Washington Street at the back entry to Bennett College, engraved in stone on two pillars at the back entrance to the campus, engraved in 1920, are the words in Latin, Perseverancia Omnia Winset. Perseverance can conquer all. And one of the things I think this principle really tells us is that when we seek to determine for ourselves what is going to be good, right, and proper for us, it is important to think about having perseverance to go the long haul. I feel so proud each day that I teach at Bennett when I think about what our forefathers and mothers must have envisioned in 1873 when Bennett was founded and then in 1920 when they engraved on that stone the fact that through perseverance we as a people would be able to conquer all. I also want to reflect on my own personal experience growing up in Durham, North Carolina in the 1950s and 60s at a time when my experience was totally segregated. I went to my elementary, my junior high, and my high school experience in a totally segregated environment. I am confident that while we were separated from a larger educational experience in the white community, that my teachers brought a quality education that I would hold up to any education that a person had during that period. My teachers were ones who also were not able to enter many of the spaces that they were qualified to enter because of segregation. And so my teachers had advanced degrees. In fact, I'm very, very proud of the fact that my French teacher did her study at the Sorbonne in France. And they brought to us in our academic experience the highest and the best that they were able to provide. And I believe part of that is what has really interested me in working in the HBCU environment. During my growing up in Durham, I also had an opportunity to experience a wonderful segment of Durham called Haiti. Haiti was named after Haiti, one of the small countries in the Caribbean that has the wonderful, wonderful history of being a black slave revolution that led to the founding of a country ruled by black people and that threw off the shackles of slavery during that time when they were under the control of France. And so my experience in Durham with Haiti was a totally self-sustained, self-determined community. We had our own stores, our own theater, our own markets, 
everything that we needed to have life for our community. And one of the things that I would tell you was very much part of the pride of our community during that time is that some of the great thinkers, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, visited Durham. And there's a wonderful video that talks about this self-sustained community that was able to have a black person wake up in the morning and have every bit of what you needed for the day supplied within your community by your black neighbors. Haiti was only one of many self-determined cities in the United States. Wilmington, Tulsa, all of those had their communities very similar to Haiti in Durham. And so while we were segregated, we nonetheless had a thriving, very, very self-determined experience and community. And then the last one that I'd like to share with you is another one related to Bennett, and that is the experience of the Bennett Bells in the 1960s. This is a history that while many of us know it, many of us are still not aware of the role that Bennett women played in what ultimately led to the sit-in movement right here in this space at the Woolworths counter. While some people have the image that those four young men who were the first to come and sit here came into that thought one morning on their own. Uh, they just got up and decided they would come and sit at the counters here at Woolworths. But that is far, far from the real history of what occurred. There were meetings and there were strategizing sessions that went on not only with Bennett and a and there were also others involved as well. And so all of those uh, students, men and women, strategized. And once the sit-ins began in the winter of 1960, the counter here at Woolworths was full of Bennett Bells along with the a and students and many other students in the Greensboro area. It showed the ability of students, young people, to decide for themselves what was going to be their way of moving through this Greensboro community. So all of these examples stand out for me as very clear ways in which our people throughout the years have embodied this wonderful principle uh, called self-determination. In addition to the history that I have spoken about in terms of the Bennett Bells and the role that they played in the sit-in movements, I want you to know that we continue in 2023 teaching our students the importance of being self-determined and being social activists to define for themselves who they are and how they want to go about in the world. It is critically important that our young people today be empowered to know that they do have the ability to determine their own futures. And I think this principle of Kwanzaa sets a wonderful, wonderful guide for how they should go about doing that. Kwanzaa for me is not a new celebration of our African heritage. I completed my undergraduate degree at Howard University during the 1960s. And as most of you know, the 1960s was a very important historical point in the life of African descended people here in the United States. And I took what I learned of black empowerment seriously. 
I had an afro, I wore the shikis, and I really did learn what it means to be an African descended person. And so my introduction to Kwanzaa began at that time. I attended and participated in many celebrations of Kwanzaa, and I began to really appreciate all that we have an opportunity to celebrate during this wonderful period and to separate it from the religious celebration of Christmas and to know it as one that reconnects us to all of what we were and all of how we celebrated ourselves before we came to this country. So as you celebrate this season of Kwanzaa, please continue to reflect on this principle of self-determination and see how it can continue to have us strive as a people to determine our own destinies, our own path, and all the ways in which we are going to make decisions for ourselves as a people and the decisions that are in our best interest. We thank you once again for joining us on our second day of Kwanzaa. We want to thank Dr. Gwendolyn McLaughlin Bookman for sharing her experience and her wealth of knowledge around the women and their role in the sit-in movement right from this very counter. We look forward to you joining us tomorrow for our third day of Kwanzaa, where we'll have Dr. Deborah Bonds sharing her presentation on the principle of Ujima, collective work and responsibility.